Welcome to r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. Thank you friends for subscribing to the channel and for so many likes. The first story. Our manager told us to mow all the grass, which left dark circles and dead grass. The second story. Manager decided that I was joking and would not leave work, but he was wrong and received a reprimand. The third story. Manager sends me on an interview for a job that I am not qualified for so I can get unemployment compensation. And the first story is, recut 20 laws because every blade of grass needs to be the same exact height. Okay. The characters, the crew, my foreman, my direct boss, John, my coworker, L, our manager, my foreman's boss, incompetent D. Some context. So this happened a summer ago. I'm a college student, and in the summer when I'm home, I typically work in landscaping and landscape design as a laborer. Think laying sod and bricks, building fences and decks, or cutting grass. I also live in Mississippi, so it's hot as balls and humid as hell in the summer. This particular summer I was working on the landscaping side, so I was cutting grass, pulling weeds, upkeep sort of stuff. When it came time to cut grass, I was on weed eater duty. My job was to do trim work, basically cut grass the mower can't reach. The day. So this Thursday was a particularly hot one, just after a good rain and so it was excessively hot and humid. To add on to this step, the job for that day was a contact place that was 20 or so houses arranged in a circle around two ponds and a walking path making the humidity even higher because of the ponds and lack of airflow. Tall trees around and in the place. The lots themselves weren't particularly big, but the place took 9 to 11 hours to do well and most of the houses also had the super cranky old people in them that would complain over the most minor things. I'm talking one weed in a flower box under a bush. So we arrive at like 6.15 and get to cutting and all that good stuff. I grab my weed eater, throw my earbuds in and do my thing. While I weed eat, I'm continually walking and occasionally will bump the weed eater with my leg, raising it up a little bit and making the grass slightly uneven every so often, maybe half an inch at the most. This usually isn't noticeable, but if it happens up against a house or a structure, you can tell if you look for it. So I'll typically go back and try to level it out the best I can if I notice it happen. I do the whole place front yards and backyards. We then weed the whole place front and back. We're getting ready to pack up and head home. It's like 4 o'clock by now, when incompetent D comes to the job site and starts looking around. He finishes up and pulls John aside and shows him around the place then leaves. This process took an hour or so. So myself, John and Elle have just burnt an hour on overtime doing nothing. By this point in the week it was typical for us to be running on overtime. John comes over to Elle and I telling us that we missed a ton of stuff and to grab the weed eaters in a bucket. We then walk around the place and John starts pointing out groups of like four blades of grass that are fractions of an inch higher than the others. Barely noticeable SH, like you really gotta look for this stuff hard. Furthermore, if you try to cut some of these with a weed eater, they bend from the downwash of the spinning strings, so you risk gouging a nice 5 to 12 inch circle in the grass, trying to cut like four blades of grass. We begin to redo the whole place front and back, pulling small a weeds here and there from under bushes, and doing our best to cut the offending blades of grass. By the second house, Elle and I are being to John, we're hot and tired. It's like 5.30 and we know this will take us two more hours. John tells us he know this is stupid, and it's not his fault he understands the stupidity in our peeveness. Cue malicious compliance. Elle and I decide we're going to make sure all offending blades of grass are cut to the same height. That new height dirt. The thing is, if you cut grass too low, it can die. We knew this, but incompetent D and the cranky old people wanted it the same height. Exactly. And that's what they were going to get. We rewalk the place and cut any grass that is against something and over the height of dirt. We also made sure to hold our weed eaters in a way that when we cut those, the offending grass we hit the surrounding grass with the full 12 inch diameter of the weed eater, leaving a nice 12 inch circle spot that you couldn't see now, but would when the grass died in a few days. We leveled all the grass against any structure, leaving a nice gouge where walls, fences, and flower beds met the lawn. We finished around 7.30 a.m. and headed home, and didn't hear a peep the next day. The next week, the lawns had 12-inch brown circles of grass everywhere. By Tuesday, incompetent D talked to John about it. John just told him the offending blades had been cut as he asked, and something along the lines of it was now all uniform in height. We couldn't help that some of the grass didn't survive the new stringent height regulations. Incompetent D never talked to John, L, or myself about it again. A few notes in Fallout. This wasn't the first time, and wouldn't be the last time incompetent D came to nitpick our work at the end of the day which would sometimes result in us having to drive across the city or walk a mile or two up a road at the end of a day to fix BS little things that weren't messed up, adding hours to already long hot days. Though it was the last time we ever had problems at that place. 
We also got the satisfaction of knowing that incompetent D had to take the numerous calls from cranky old people about their lawns for a few weeks. These people would cuss us out, even before this incident, so I don't want to imagine what they told him. The lawns had still had pretty noticeable dead spots and scars when I left towards the end of the summer. Also, incompetent D saw himself as better than any of the filthy laborers, L and I, and would avoid critiquing us to our faces. This is primarily because the few times he nitpicked us directly, we either told him why it was stupid or handed him our equipment and told him to do it himself, which he would then proceed to F up. This was a commotion sentiment he held towards all of the crews under his supervision, and their reactions when he critiqued them similarly were similar to ours. In the mornings at the shop, he would sometimes talk about how we needed to be more respectful to him because he was our boss, to which people would reply something about him respecting our quality work, which it was 99% of the time not nitpicking stupid SH, and not showing up at the end of a day to give us more dumb SH to do, such as chop a tree down, and then drive off expecting us to load it up when he had an open top trailer and we had a full box truck. What we did made its way to other crews, and they carried out similar antics, which led to him getting a tough time from his bosses, who held him responsible for these events. The effects of this general disdain eventually got him to so much, so you could see it just by the way he carried himself and the stress on his face. Edit. Incompetent D was so bad at his job that he got paid less or at the same rate as the crew foreman under him, while holding the title of being their boss. I know because he would complain about this too when talking to the foreman. The next story is... Okay, I quit then. In high school I got a part-time job at a food store we would call no skills. At the time, minimum wage was $5.15 an hour, and they paid $9 an hour if you worked graveyards. That was killer money. So I worked graveyards Friday and Saturday nights during the school year. I got in at 8 p.m. and left about 7 in the morning. Black Friday was coming up in about a month, and my friends like to go out and shop around for fun. I requested to leave early at 10 a month in advance, which was approved by the cool manager I'll call Charlie. That night comes and the a-hole manager is working. Well, call him Dave. Dave decided to give the night off to two other employees, leaving us very short-staffed. I of course requested my time off a month ago, so whatever, not my issue. I get into work and let him know I'm leaving at 10 just as a reminder. His response was, we'll see how far along we are by then and see. I didn't like how he phrased that, but I thought, whatever, I'm leaving either way. So it's about 9.50. I've been working my A off stocking shelves to get as much done as possible and go to let him know I'm leaving. He stares at me and says we're too far behind and I can't leave and to come ask him at 11 instead. I tell him no. I have plans and took it off so I'm heading out. He starts to grumble to himself, gives this little speech about how everyone else will have to stay super late if I go, yada yada. I say I'm still leaving. I took it off a month ago, so it was known well in advance. He stares at me and tells me if I leave, I shouldn't bother coming back and that I'll be fired. High school me says that's not fair and whatnot, then he just says I can stay or lose my job. This job is just so I can have some spending money, but he seems to think that I'm like some other staff who actually need the job and can be bullied around. I just tell him, okay, I quit, and started to walk away. He tried to say something, but he just mumbled as he had no idea what to say. He never expected me to actually leave. The next day, Charlie calls me up and apologizes for what happened, and asks if I really wanted to quit. I told him no and about what happened. He assured me Dave would leave me alone, and had been talked to. I later found out he was also no longer allowed to approve time off anymore, since he left the store so short-handed, and the morning crew actually has to help stock the shelves because it still wasn't done. Bonus story, I did stay working there and over the summer went full time. A buddy of mine was jealous of the money I made and also got a job there working graveyards with me. Part of the job is facing the aisles before leaving to make it all look pretty. The whole team would tackle the aisles together so we can talk while doing it. With my buddy being new, we played a little joke and told him that part of facing, including shaking all the salad dressings, as they would settle during the day. We left him to it and moved on and about two aisles later we notice he's still not with us and Charlie would help us face when his duties were done, asked where he was. We told him the joke and went back to check on him. To our amazement, he was with the dressing shaking them and had already shaken most of them already. We figured he was being a smart A and was doing it so he didn't have to face, but when we told him it was a joke, he got pretty peeved off, which made it even funnier. The last story is, sorry, no unemployment for you, but, so in this story, it wasn't me doing the MC, but I was the intended beneficiary of it. So I guess this is my story. Back in the early 90s, I was working for a company that provided staffing for US government agencies. I was a system administrator at a large department of transportation facility. One day I walked in, was told to see my supervisor, who very apologetically told me that Uncle Sam no longer wanted me working there, and well, I was fired. 
I was told to go to the contracting company's office on the other side of town, which I had never been to, save the day I was hired. Shocked, I drove up there. I was like 24 and had never been fired before. In retrospect, I know what happened. The project I was working on was failing. Not because of anything I did or didn't do. The concept itself was flawed. There were three people who worked on the project. Two were federal FTEs, plus me, the contractor. Anyone who has had experience with this knows the contractors are the first to go. So I'm sitting with the manager of the local branch, who has an email from the government employee in charge of the doomed project, listing a parade of horribles that I had done. Some of the minor ones were true. I had been late a few times, but the major ones were just fabrications. They claimed that there was a problem with the networking and that a contractor had to be engaged to fix the problem. Is that true? Well, yes, I am that contractor. I diagnosed the problem and then I fixed the problem. That's my job, or at least it was until a couple of hours ago. The manager realizes pretty quickly what's going on. Not that it gets me my job back. As we go through the separation procedures, he tells me that per company policy, he's required to document that I'm not eligible for unemployment compensation. I just nodded because I didn't know much about these things. He says I'm getting a two week notice and that for the next two weeks I'm to show up to his office. He offered the use of office equipment to print resumes, apply for other jobs and the like. So after a couple of days, he says he set up an interview for me at another project at the same facility. Sure, I went down there, sat with the project manager. Interview lasted less than five minutes. So we're a COBOL shop here. What's your experience with COBOL? None whatsoever. So we both realized it was a bad fit. I went back to the office confused as hell. The site manager knew I didn't have COBOL experience. Why did he send me there? I found out a few weeks later I had applied for unemployment compensation anyway, upon the urging of friends who said that policy sounded really sketchy. I had an interview at the unemployment office and they looked over the paperwork, noticed the form that said ineligible, and the lady explained that I could contest that. I said sure. She asks me if I've been applying for work. I said yes. She asked if I've had any interviews. I told her about the one I had. Her eyes widened, she smiled. If they interviewed you for another position, that means you are not terminated for cause. You were let go because of lack of work. That's a layoff. She then marks on the paper that I'm eligible for unemployment compensation. I ask if I still need to contest their finding. No, they can contest my determination. But given that they actively tried to keep you employed after these events, it's not gonna fly. He did you a big favor by sending you on that interview. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.